Okay, people are joining. Okay, I think I can stop sharing the screen. Okay, <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione. Welcome to this um, November, uh, October, sorry, <laughs> it's not yet November, to so this October version of, uh, of data at, at breakfast. Yeah? It, um, it is a big pleasure this morning to introduce to you uh, Dr. Brett van Nieker. Uh, some of you might have uh, met him before in uh, in Data Breakfast. He's um, he, he's spoken in this um, in this webinar series before. Yeah, Brett uh, is a computer scientist at uh, at UKZ10. He's uh, NRF rated. Uh, he's chairing uh, a working group of the International Federation of Information Processing, in particular on the ICT uses in peace and war. He's the uh, editor and co-editor on several. Uh, international journals, among them the International Journal of Cyber Warfare and Terrorism, the International Journal of Information Security and Privacy, and the Journal of Information Warfare. So he sounds like a very dangerous man to, to me. Yeah, um, uh, he, he's taking part in many, 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 many conferences, <clears throat> but importantly, he's also a certified information security manager and uh, one of the first. Uh, South African uh, information security management professionals. Yeah, so Brett, we are we are really very happy to to have us uh, with us this morning, in particular because October is still the the um, cyber security month. So the, the the topic is really is really appropriate and and will help us um, uh, alert people on 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 risks that are currently. Uh, active on the on the on the internet, and since we are all living in the internet these days, that there is even more reason to be to be concerned. Brett, if you would like to start sharing your screen, I will briefly introduce while you do that uh, Yazira and Ilya. Uh, with us this morning on the panel is also Dr. Yazira uh, Ismail. She's a lecturer in uh, in physics at UKZ10, and she's working on uh, on quantum cryptography. And uh, Yazira. Uh, kindly agree to help us uh, moderate the questions at the end of the presentation. Yeah. And Dr. Sinaiski is, um, you, you see him very often in our webinars, he's assisting with the, with the technological back office of, of, of the whole operation. So Brett, we can see your, your, your slide. slides, you're, you're welcome to, to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so initially, we, we started off with, with this topic. Um, and then being the 31st of horror, I've added a slight Halloween theme just to make things a little bit more entertaining and uh, relaxed. Um, so I'm not going to focus purely on South Africa, because obviously the internet is global. Um, and a number of things happening overseas could very well have uh, implications uh, within South Africa. Um, so obviously, the, the, the last time I spoke was back in May. Uh, when we were still uh, sort of fresh in um, into lockdown and uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, so it's, there's been quite a few um, recent uh, incidents since then. Um, but at that point, you know, we had seen a huge uptake in, in cyber crime using the COVID pandemic um, as sort of like a lure or a catch to, to, to try and get people and businesses. Um, and that fortunately, kind of started petering out when, when people normalized to the situation. Um, so whilst it was still a panic, there was something very useful to catch uh, people with. And, and once they get used to it, they're not as concerned. Um, you know, the, it, it wasn't as productive for the cyber criminals, um, but we are still seeing some related attacks. Um, so just to start off with a little bit of theory, um, privacy, data protection, and cyber security are not identical to each other. Um, privacy is a much broader concept, um, which will cover a range of, of aspects, not only digital, but obviously in the, uh, in the real physical world as well. Um, and then data protection sort of is, is overlapping with that, 
um, because these are all the me mechanisms and, and measures that we would take place to keep data secure. Um, so where they overlap is obviously uh, when you have your, your personal information out in a, in a business um, or stored somewhere, obviously we need those mechanisms to be able to secure the data so it doesn't get breached. And that breach would then obviously uh, result in a, uh, a privacy issue. Again, cybersecurity is, is um, quite a large um, area. Um, so it, it's not just the data protection. We have to worry about you know, your system security, network security. Um, in, in the last few years, as the, sort of the, the international geopolitical aspect um, is, is becoming um, much, much stronger. Even though it's been around for you know, over a decade, um, I, th I think the geopolitical aspect, um, particularly around uh, laws uh, between nations, international laws and, and so on, um, it, it is, is becoming um, quite a large sticking point um, with some of the incidents and so on. Um, and in some cases, cybersecurity is actually the polar opposite of, of privacy. Um, so if we even go back to Cold War days or, or um, before, and, and now since 9-11, um, and the, the issue with terrorism, you've got this concept of you need to invade privacy for monitoring reasons for national security kind of thing. So cybersecurity in, in a similar way is um, you need to monitor. So there, there are aspects to it, which are, as I say, the opposite um, of privacy. Um, so just like a, a mini case study, um, the Five Eyes Spying Group um, is repeatedly re trying to request um, that most of your, your technology providers, uh, especially with your instant messaging, um, will provide a, a backdoor for end-to-end -end encryption. In other words, they all have the ability to monitor any communication um, via instant messaging. Now, we all know that uh, WhatsApp has um, implemented some form of end-to-end -end encryption. Um, that is the, one of the first to do so was Signal, um, which was created like a, a, a nonprofit for um, sort of a privacy advocate group. Um, but now the, the, the spies, again, want access to all that information for their ability to gather intelligence. And obviously the five eyes sounds like this rather sinister uh, secret society type of thing. Um, but then essentially it's just uh, five um, intelligence agencies or five countries intelligence agencies, UK, US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, but then again, there, there is still this sort of concern around um, you know, the, the amount of information they share, what they share, how they, they gain access to information and so on. In addition to this, there's the nine eyes and the 14 eyes. So that, that there's um, a couple of expansions to, to the agreement. So I think the nine eyes is like France plus a few Scandinavian countries. 14 eyes has also then got Germany and a few other European countries. Um, and I think Israel comes into it as well. <clears throat> so if you search five eyes on Wikipedia, um, they list some notable surveillance targets, uh, one being Nelson Mandela, um, and others being like Charlie Chaplin, Princess Diana, uh, John Lennon. Um, so people that you wouldn't see <laughs> as overly threatening, <clears throat> but um, you know <laughs> there are notable people that um, have found themselves uh, of interest. Um, and I've left out uh, Angela Merkel for a reason because. You think she's head of state of Germany, which is under 14 hours, one of the allies, yet she still was potentially a surveillance target, um, which just shows that in, in the world of espionage, especially online, um, pretty much anything's fair game. Um, and with the, a reference to the song with someone's always watching me and I have no privacy in, in the modern world, um, we have an issue with all our data being online. And, and the problem is we actually put a lot of the data there ourselves. Um, so going back to 1960s, the concern was you know, the, the government's going to, to wiretap us or, or bug uh, the house if, if we show certain lines of a political thought or something along those lines. Um, but in the modern day, uh, when we have Internet of Things and things like um, Alexa, and um, <clears throat> Echo and, and so on, um, we, we literally are interacting with a wiretap daily um, and they could be giving us the weather, a recipe for pancakes, 
um, or, or the latest news is whether the petrol price is going up or down. Um, but that is essentially recording pretty much everything that's going on. Even if you don't explicitly activate it, um, it needs to monitor things in the background. Um, and again, to illustrate that is when you have connected uh, CCTV security cameras, um, you know, those things are recording and that information is then being stored uh, in the cloud and that's how you actually manage to access it from um, a mobile device or something. So anyone who can get into that cloud account can then monitor what's happened. And I couldn't find it um, again for this presentation, but I read a paper where um, you don't actually need to get into the camera feeds themselves to get an idea if someone's in the house or not. Um, is that when people are moving around, the images tend to change. So there's more data being transferred up to the cloud. When no one's home, there's a very static images. So it's a very consistent uh, stream of data. Um, and as a result, if, if someone could at least see the data stream, they would be able to say that you're not home because there, there's, um, you know, there's not the fluctuations, there's no sign of movement um, based on, on varying amounts of data. Um, so immediately, if, if that's um, constant over a longish period, they immediately know that you know, you're not at home. So uh, your, your home, and if they have your address, is then their game. Um, and, and taking this uh, a step further, um, just over a month ago, uh, we had an issue in, in Cape Town where one of the top uh, policemen um, was assassinated and he was tracked using openly available data from uh, the mobile company. Um, so there was a, a lot of media attention around this uh, at the time, um, which is how I started getting involved um, with, with this, some of these specific lines of things um, when, when the media started asking questions. And in, in this specific incident, for what's been happening is you get a number of web application service providers um, so that they sort of contract to your main mobile uh, networks and provide additional services. And one of those services is the ability for um, tracking location. Uh, so it, it could be similar to your car tracks. Um, you, you could have like a, a family security thing where you can maybe track your children, something along those lines. And you can probably also have varying degrees of, um, sort of accuracy to this. So even if your GPS is off, the way the, the cell phone works, you could probably pick up um, from the towers at least a um, sort of an approximate location. Um, <clears throat> so what transpired is that um, some of these uh, service providers haven't actually been following what they were contractually um, agreed on in, in terms of privacy and so on. So they have now been, um, I've seen lawsuits being, being implemented against them because they've been very lax with what they've been doing with uh, the data, which seriously is a, a, um, a strong concern for privacy. The fact that people who could then pay for access or um, maybe investors or someone could get access to someone's actual location, um, not, not just um, you know, some random uh, in information like age or, or uh, address. They could actually pinpoint where someone is. And then if we go back a few years, this is not actually a new problem, um, which again is very worrying is why have mobile networks now not actually caught on, caught on to the fact that, um, you know, that there could be severe breaches of privacy. Um, so back then it, it was in Athens, which is hence the name the Athens affair. Um, it was around the time of the um, Olympics in, in Athens and someone, uh, a suspected nation state managed to get into the mobile network and compromise the technology that's used for legal intercept. Uh, so that, that's the kind of technology that sort of your police and um, intelligence security forces uh, would use if they needed to get a court order uh, and, and then intercept um, traffic for obvious legal purposes. Um, so when, when they got compromised, they, they pretty much had access to a lot of information, even up to senior government officials, um, so minister level uh, officials, where potentially if they made a phone call, um, the attackers could get an SMS with like the metadata of the, um, the call. So, you know, who made the call, uh, who the recipient of the call was, sort of the time and so on. 
Um, and then they could potentially also uh, intercept that and also probably get the copies of um, the SMSs and so on. So if you think that that, again, the, the breach of privacy there and, and um, the, the issues that, that came out of this, you would expect the mobile providers to be a little bit more uh, careful with some of the information um, that they have um, access to. <laughs> um, then the second one following very shortly after this um, was ENCA approached me because there had been a number of people uh, who had been um, attacked using the, the online um, taxi services like Uber, Bolt, um, et cetera. Um, so essentially what was happening there was uh, they would call for, for a ride um, and then the car that actually turns up isn't the one that uh, they were supposed to be getting, um, but the person clearly knew that, you know, that they had requested a ride. Um, and then eventually they had ended up being attacked. Um, again, this, this isn't um, a, a, a brand new issue. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure to the full extent that it was happening in South Africa, um, but just doing, doing a bit of research uh, when I started being asked questions about it, um, that I noticed in, in the UK, uh, it, it had happened uh, last year, it, especially around London, where there was a number of drivers um, who were, we can say, illegitimate, um, and were able to actually go and uh, pick up people, and, and they weren't actually supposed to be doing that. Um, so there clearly was some type of, of flaw um, that allowed this to happen. Um, one thing that was going forward was what they called account takeovers. So again, it's the usual um, username password issue that uh, if your account is compromised, people can see what you're doing. Um, but on the other side, if they compromise one of the driver's account, they can obviously see everything the driver can see. So that they can start picking up where people are potentially requesting rides uh, and so on. Um, so that, that was a bit of an issue. And um, Uber was under threat of, of losing their license. I, I think they managed to put a stay on it and, and correct it. Um, and then even before that, um, they had been fined, uh, quite a hefty fine for something that happened way back in uh, 2016, um, where, the, where they had been hacked and a number of private, uh, private information had uh, been released because of that. Um, and then the, there's the other type of imposter that uh, we, we've found online um, in ironically the game among us where the focus is an imposter, um, people have been um, not necessarily hacking into it, but um, logging in on malicious accounts and then spamming people with adverts or political messages uh, or something along those lines. Um, so the, the, they've been complaints where the, they, they've tried to connect to multiple games or multiple servers, and they, they still have this issue that um, the game was being hammered by these um, the sort of malicious advertising, um, political messages, and so on. Um, a lot of it, again, revolving around the US elections, which is happening next week. Um, then the other one is Nando's, um, not, not in South Africa, mainly the UK, and I think a little bit in, in Europe and, and the US. Um, again, user accounts have been compromised um, and then used to order rather large extravagant meals. Um, so basically the attackers just changed the cell phone number, placed orders, managed to collect the orders. Um, and if someone had a, a credit card registered with the account, uh, they were paying for it. Um, so it just goes to illustrate the, um, you know, what, what's the benefit if you, if you think that, oh, no, you know, I don't have any information that um, anyone would want. Well, maybe you do. You've registered your credit card number for Uber or um, an Nando's account or something along those lines. And if a hacker gets in there, they could um, benefit from those services at your expense. Um, then just staying international for a little while, um, there, there was a rather large, what we call botnet, uh, which is essentially a network of compromised computers that are under control. So those are known as zombies or, or bots, um, because the, the, the attackers can then control those computers and use it for a variety of things. Um, so this trick bot one was particularly uh, troublesome that it has been morphed and updated numerous times. Um, so initially it started off purely as a banking trojan, meaning it was designed specifically to steal banking information. Then it became a bit broader 
and became just generally stealing information. Um, so I could try and go after tax information and, and a number of other things. Then again, it was changed, so I could start sending uh, spam emails. Um, could download other malware, so um, it, it could then maybe in, install something else on the computers for other purposes. It's got the ability to hide itself. Um, it was being updated recently again. Um, so it, it was particularly troublesome, um, and, and there's been a lot of focus on it um, over the last uh, couple of months. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a rather strange precedent set uh, where Microsoft um, <clears throat> tried to use like a proprietary technology type law uh, to take down the botnet. Um, and it was like a, a coalition of technology companies. And then later it was also found that the US Cyber Command was involved. Um, so then they, they tried to take down the, the botnet. Um, ultimately, they were not successful. Um, they've already discovered, even after they took down the servers uh, that, that were being used for the attacks, um, that the, the, the attackers just created new servers elsewhere, uh, which are more difficult to, to get hold of. Um, so where Microsoft, in, in terms of a legal precedent, uh, came in, um, they were using Windows uh, software development kits um, as part of the, the malware code. Um, so they tried to use that uh, as a breach of copyright, I think, um, to, to take down the um, take down the botnet. There, there has been a, a bit of a sort of backlash around that, that legal aspect. People are saying that you, you should have more secure uh, things that, that can't be used for malware rather than going into uh, the, these type of copyright laws because we, you now, the, the SDK is, is designed in a way to develop code. Um, so it, it's becoming this kind of freedom of expression type uh, discussion um, around this. Um, but what was really concerning to a certain degree is um, that you now have a military organization doing takedowns of a criminal network. So they're kind of encroaching on what law enforcement really should be doing. And we're now seeing a lot of this um, type of, of activity geopolitically. So recently, Australia has also been updating a number of laws. Um, so I had been approached to also um, give input into to some of the things. Um, so the first one is just the, the general um, cyber uh, infrastructure or, or um, general technology engagement with, with other countries. Um, and at the same time, they released a new cybersecurity critical infrastructure um, protection, where some of the wording was a little bit um, ambiguous, where it actually looked like a critical infrastructure providers could retaliate against potential attackers. Um, so that would then be allowing civilians to conduct cyber attacks against potentially other targets in, in other countries that they uh, suspected them of an attack. Now, the, the particular article I put up there says that's not the case. There are limitations, but they are allowed to take what they say active measures. Um, and again, it's a very ambiguous term um, in cybersecurity is how far do you go as part of active measures? Because some interpret that as hacking back. Um, so th this again, uh, you know, it, it's one of those laws that are, are very, or concepts that, that are walking a, a very fine line. Um, and you can imagine the, the, the chaos that will start if um, a, a civilian infrastructure provider um, tries to retaliate against the nation state who then retaliates back. Um, you, you, you ask them for trouble. Um, and the other interesting one was uh, the US tried to charge um, the Russian hackers um, over a number of cyber attacks. <laughs> the thing is these hackers aren't again civilians. They are military and intelligence officials um, in Russia. Uh, so again, that in theory has state protection. And another interesting aspect is those, some of those attacks were not against the US, they were against other countries. So the US is, is trying to take, take its uh, stand as like world protector type. Um, so in, in one way people like it because they are um, trying to protect other countries. Um, but then again, you know, the, the response initially was, well, this is just an example of Russophobia. Um, it wasn't us, but then recently I also saw that a number of um, states, uh, I don't know if it's states or counties, um, but a lot of the US voter information had been hacked and released on the internet, again by um, 
one of the supposed Russian um, strings. Uh, so obviously those indictments have had absolutely no effect whatsoever. <clears throat> and what we're seeing is universities are still a target. Um, it seemed to die off a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, that um, during the pandemic when the universities obviously took a break, um, it slacked, um, slacked off. But now with, with universities trying to go back, um, again, similar types of threat actors uh, appears coming out of the Middle East, um, particularly Iran, um, going after universities. These ones, again, mostly like looks like the UK uh, were targets. Um, but it does raise a, a, an interesting question of why are educational institutions so vulnerable? Um, and particularly recently in the last uh, couple of years, we've seen more and more attacks being leveraged against um, educational institutions, particularly um, universities. And I know South African universities have been targeted. Um, particularly around like web defacements uh, and those types of things um, in the past. Uh, recently, we haven't seen anything major, um, or, well, at least you know, in, in the newspapers, uh, when I say major, the, that it <laughs> needs to be made public. But um, you know, well, one of the issues that we have is universities are a unique type of organization where your client is in the network, your client is naturally curious and trying to test the schools, they're meant to be learning. So as soon as you put someone like that with some basic skills, especially around computing and, and so on, they will tend to be curious. Um, and they might try and obviously limit it to get to say free movies or free series or free games, something along those lines, um, maybe social types of games <clears throat> where they, they can network and play across the network. Um, so then they need to maybe get around security control uh, to be able to do that. Um, but on the other side is the focus tends to maybe be more on um, delivery of teaching and learning, delivery of research, so ad hoc connections of, of various um, sets of equipment, and the funding isn't necessarily pushed into uh, the IT department, which sometimes might become purely just a support function. Um, and then, you know, the security aspects aren't really dealt with properly. Um, also, educational institutions tend to do a lot of research. Um, they've got a lot of freedom of expression. Um, so you know, they, they could do contract research for governments, which would be of interest to uh, certain countries, uh, specifically to see what's being researched about them. Um, so it makes universities a, a very, very attractive target when especially you've got a very vulnerable population being the students. Um, there. <clears throat> um, so just a few more issues that are most are fairly recent in South Africa. Again, with the education, um, a number of teachers personal information being leaked online from KZN's uh, education department, um, justice department hit by a costly cyber attack in Peter Marisburg. I think um, 10 million was lost there if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> um, a JSC listed company um, was hit by a cyber attack having um, effects on their stocks. And then the, the big one, which uh, would align with the, the pandemic is um, the large hospital group uh, was also attacked um, and they had to go into manual operations for um, hospital check-ins and so on for, for at least a few days uh, because of that. So that it didn't um, disrupt um, sort of medical operations in, in terms of um, the actual operating theaters and, and so on, um, but it, it just, you know, the, the manual processes to for, for the patients just uh, went into a manual um, and the, the systems were offline for a little while. And then the, the really big one um, is the Experian breach. Um, so that, that has been building up, building up, and, and there's still effects being felt because of this. Um, so it turns out that the breach actually happened in May. Um, what they originally said was that, oh no, uh, there, there was someone that left the company or um, it was sort of a contractor and I had requested information in such a way that they really shouldn't have had access, but they were tricked uh, into getting their information. Um, this was only really <laughs> sort of brought into the public uh, domain um, in August. So a few months after uh, this had happened, um, their ex explanation was that um, they, were, they were trying to get a number of court orders uh, and the legal process that they wanted it as a surprise. 
so that they couldn't um, make it public because it would affect the legal proceedings to try and stop this. Um, and then suddenly all this information uh, started being leaked on the internet. So a lot of that data was now found um, and it has been quite a few sudden um, news articles that, hey, we found the data from the internet. Um, so you can see the first one, 2nd of September, then, then a week later again. Um, so this is obviously problematic uh, that there was, I think 24 million um, individuals and about 800 odd thousand businesses information as, as part of that. So that's a huge um, amount of information that, that attackers could, could use. And they are essentially um, a, a financial company to a certain degree. So you could expect these account numbers and a few other things that, that um, are involved in this. Um, that we have now obviously, uh, since our last book, got the Protection of Social Information Act almost 100% uh, implemented. Um, whilst we're still within our, our US grace period, um, this, this is a very severe breach um, to have happened um, just after the, the, the law was actually, um, or brought into the public light just after the law um, had been implemented. Um, so it's very interesting now that, you know, what they initially said that no, everything's fine, et cetera, and then we found the data on the internet. It could be a very, very interesting case study of, you know, how our laws are actually going to be able to handle this. Um, but I don't know how long it's going to take to, to actually resolve um, some of the problems. <laughs> um, and, and a couple incidents that I'm going to be very broad here, because I dealt with them personally, um, helping these people um, to a certain degree, was um, when someone actually lost quite a bit of money, um, they had a phone call, they knew the account numbers, that they, they knew quite a bit of information, pretending to be from the bank. Um, then, then they said no, that they needed to do something, got them to log on. Um, he said that they, they were actually had them busy for, for quite a while um, doing stuff on the computer. But obviously, when he realized that it was a scam, he um, panicked and wasn't entirely sure what had happened. Um, and they, they were trying to transfer money offshore. Um, and so eventually, um, after having to, to file a um, report with the police, um, the banks managed to trace it back and, and realized that it hadn't left the, the money hadn't left the country yet, and it was still in the forex space, they managed to block it and recover the money, fortunately. Um, the second one, very, very similar incident, was about a week later, um, where again, they, they seemed to have a, a number of um, like ID numbers, account numbers, um, the person's wife answered the phone number and, and they tried to get her to release her ID number and, and certain information. The excuse being that money had been transferred out of the account um, and that, you know, that they're, they're trying to fix it. Um, and so immediately it was very suspicious being that um, why would they need the wife's ID number to be able to correct a transfer that already happened? Um, and then also apparently that they had said a certain amount had been transferred, which was more than it was in that particular account anyway. Um, and, and when the wife refused to give the information, they actually got very aggressive, um, which is a sure sign that something was not um, above board here. Um, and I could be wrong on this, but I'm kind of suspicious that all of this is, is seeming to be picking up after the Experian breach. Um, and what I've noticed also is the number of and the type of adverts um, that people are suddenly getting a lot more of on, on the cell phones, like the SMS adverts and, and um, some of those annoying calls tend to be around um, sort of like your, your money lending uh, insurance type of things. So car insurance, car trucking, um, the, those types of adverts. And I haven't had for quite a while. And suddenly um, after the information from Experian had been put on the um, internet, suddenly I'm getting all of these messages coming through. Um, and a lot of people have complained about it. And this is not the first time. I think one of the breaches back in 2018 happened as well. Um, information was leaked, and, and then suddenly we started getting all these, these, these phone calls. Um, so you can see, even if, if you don't necessarily fall for, for the tricks, it's, it's annoying. You keep on getting the, the, the irritating things. <laughs> um, and then what well, Gain said recently, they estimate the cost um, of a breach to a company on average to be around 40 million rand in South Africa. Um, so that, that takes into account a number of things. Um, 
uh, sorry, it wasn't exactly clear. Um, I, I didn't read the full report of, of what um, they were taking into account, but you can start considering things like um, if there's a breach, you need to get some form of instant response. You need to get maybe a, a specialist company to come in. Uh, you need to, you know, for remediation to identify where the breach was, how do you close the breach, do a do security assessment. Um, the systems might have to be taken offline, which could loss, be loss of uh, productivity, um, so indirect costs. Um, so like, like the, the last hospital group actually took down the email systems as well. So you can imagine, you know, delays uh, with some of the administrative things, maybe for billing, et cetera. So that they could have a, a financial impact as well. I don't think this is actually taking into account um, the Poppy Act. Um, so we might see with, with um, Poppy Act that um, once that grace period is over, is actually going to increase uh, this cost quite drastically because it, that can include now up to a fine of um, 10 million. Um, so we can start expecting maybe on the average going up to 45, 50 million in, in about a year or two time. Um, so that's actually quite a significant amount of money. Um, and if you think about it for maybe a large corporation, um, in the greater scheme of things, maybe not so much, but uh, for a small business, medium business, that, 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 that could be significant for them. Um, and I think now also with um, the Poppy Act around, one of the, the challenges is that you have to publicly announce or, or at least allow, um, give notice to people who could be affected of the breach. Um, so that is no longer allowing the sort of the cover of being able to sweep things under the rug and, and try and maneuver around it. Uh, so your um, client base immediately could lose faith uh, in, in your handling of these things. Like again, if, if this consistent uh, bad news report around it. Um, so I think that is where, where, where companies really would be uh, hit is if <laughs> there is a significant breach um, and the client base actually just get fed up with them and, and move to a competitor. Um, the other side is what's also um, hidden at, at this stage, and I don't quite know how it's going to work, um, is that there is actual jail time um, under Papua as well. Um, so it could potentially be um, the accountable people under governance. Um, so maybe like the executive level might uh, have to take uh, that accountability. I don't know how far down the line within the company that, that, that would actually um, slow down in, in terms of if uh, the, the information regulator does decide uh, to put in some form of um, jail time as, um, as punishment. <laughs> so the conundrum is obviously we, we always push to take security measures to protect ourselves. Um, we're being hammered with this. But then the problem is down the line, some company gets breached and our information is exposed anyway. And the question is, how did that information actually get there in the first place? Um, and was last year at the conference, um, someone told a, a rather interesting story, was that they were doing a, a, like a privacy type of uh, assessment around data stored in, in the cloud. So they would go to the company, like do the assessment, um, and they said, well, you know, do you have all the information? No, no, but you know, we subcontract. OK, fine. And they're like, why do you subcontract? No, because it's cheaper to deal with the services over there. Um, so we, we would rather push out uh, and store the information offshore somewhere. Okay, fine. So they go to that company, you know, the, the one provider, and try and do an assessment there. Okay, with no, no, but they subcontract somewhere else. Why? Oh, because it's cheaper over there. Um, so there's like these middle companies right in between. So if, you know, you you give your information out, and what you don't know is that there are subcontractors in the background, especially when we start talking things like cloud computing. Um, uh, becoming more and more prevalent is that the information might be actually stored somewhere else. So this doesn't absolve the, the company that you have a contract with uh, from any uh, form of accountability, um, as long as that, you know, they, they take relevant measures. So you need that um, contractual um, sort of thing with, with your subcontractors to ensure that their privacy and um, sort of security is, is in place. But as we saw with um, the assassination that um, those so, uh, sort of subcontracted service providers weren't actually following the contract in terms of the privacy. Um, so that this becomes really, really problematic now. Um, so I, I think uh, it's a good thing now that our Poppy Act is in place um, and ready to go, as well as hopefully that the cyber crimes bill 
uh, will be uh, fully enacted um, soon um, to give us a little bit more protection um, against these types of things. <clears throat> so what can you do to protect yourself? Uh, in the old days, uh, you used to be able to get one of these. Um, and as far as I can tell, this is actually a legitimate um, vampire protection kit uh, where you've got mirrors and supposed holy water and fakes and stuff. Um, not going to help much today. <laughs> uh, so essentially, you have a much better tool, and that's your brain. Um, so you need to keep your works about you, actually think about what's in front of you um, when you come across something abnormal. Um, so obviously, the key thing that everyone starts um, pushing is use strong passwords, um, use different passwords for different accounts, um, especially, you know, the, the key accounts put a very strong um, separate password for like the banks or, or um, anything where there could be a major uh, impact if, if it gets breached. Um, I, I will um, share these slides as well, um, but you can go to that link. It's the, the UK's National Cyber Security Center. They've actually put um, up a list of the top 100,000 passwords that are, are being hacked. Um, so that is also a website that, that you can, you can book for uh, information you know if you have been compromised or any of your user accounts are associated to a breach um, so they've done a lot of analysis on, on the passwords uh, that had been hacked or, or made publicly available um, so obviously go to that link if your password is one of those change it um, because essentially those passwords are extremely weak um, the other side is using two-factor authentication um, so that's essentially uh, when you try and log in, you get something like a, a message on your phone or, or something along those lines. Um, <clears throat> so why it's called two-factor authentication, if you, you think normal authentication is a username and a password. So your username is just an identifier. Um, people incorrectly say that's two-factor authentication to say there's a username and a password, so two factors. No, the username is just an identifier. Um, the password is your actual authentication proving that you are who you say you are. Um, so in theory, that's why your password has to be secret. Um, so that's something that you know. Now, if you add another fact to that, it could be something that you have. So that's where the cell phone comes in. So they, they push a message onto the cell phone that you could then uh, get a one-time pin or um, maybe um, sort of like a, an accept reject type message. Um, so th th there's two layers of authentication now. Um, but they, they've now tried to verify it's you based on the assumption that you have your cell phone. Um, and there's a variety of other things. If you go into certain banks, you'll notice some people have like a, a little device or something on their wrist uh, that they'll have to then go check it and, and type in something on the computer uh, to, to approve uh, transactions. So that's again the type of two factor authentication. Um, so that's like a randomly generated um, little key that is sent to a server that um, it'll change like every couple minutes or so. They are now verifying that, you know, that person is actually um, there because they, they can check it um, and then put in the corresponding uh, code. And obviously never ever give out any forms of passwords over the phones, emails, SMSs, WhatsApps, anything. Do not give out that information. Also, do not follow any instructions that they give you. If they pretend to be the bank, and they want you to do something, you can say, okay, fine, you contact your branch, get off that call, go onto the bank's official website and, and find out what the contact information is and then get hold of them and find out what, what's happening. Um, that, that is a much safer um, way of, of dealing with it than just blindly following whatever so, some person on, on the other end of the phone um, tells you. And again, here we have a bit of a conundrum that <laughs> quite often you get a phone call um, and they try and put the focus on you must prove who you are. But at the same time, you actually need to know that the person on the other end of the phone, they called you, are they legitimate? Um, so that, that there needs to be that type of uh, verification as well, which companies haven't quite cottoned on to uh, how to do that um, properly as well. Also, things like your one-time pins for cell phones, et cetera, um, even if, if it's like a, a SIM swap or uh, one of those, if, if you're not expecting a one-time pin, um, don't, don't ever give, give that out. You know, if, if you're standing in a cell phone shop and you're doing a legitimate thing there, 
and there's all, all the bank and you know you're expecting that that's fine um but again if someone just calls you and says hey you know we, we're doing a security thing or uh we need to update or one of those common things um what's what's the one-time pin that you've got that, that there's something suspicious and again i know someone who, who had exactly that happen um there was a phone call you know you're going to get a one-time pin etc uh, please give it to us uh, gave it across um, and they, they were doing a fraudulent um, SIM swap. Unfortunately, they only lost I think 100 grand or something like that. And also immediately realized afterwards uh, what had happened. So, so managed to um, contact the service providers to, to correct it. Um, but the thing is, if you don't need to give out information, don't do that. <laughs> um, some other things, obviously a good antivirus um, is, is important. You do get free ones to give you very basic protection. Um, but if you really want to be secure, uh, go with like a trusted known name. Um, there are a number of websites that actually do uh, testing of, of the various antivirus um, internet security suites. Um, so you, you can see how that they stack up over the last few years. Um, and some of those also go into smart phones. Um, and, and this is important because you have banking apps and a number of things on your smartphone, which could be um, potentially compromised as well. Um, so, for example, uh, Google's just blocked a number of apps, uh, which look fairly legitimate, um, which have malicious components to them. Um, so it, you can get maybe an internet suite where you can install antivirus on, um, or the internet security suite on, on your actual computer or laptop, um, but then you also get a, a version that can go onto uh, your smartphones and tablets and so on. Um, so it does also do updates and, and um, I do scans every now and again, and also protect things like if you accidentally go to a potentially malicious website, it, it does help uh, maybe block those. <laughs> the other concept is use it or lose it. Um, if you have certain functionality or certain, certain apps or software or something, and you don't really use it, try and, and get rid of it. I know your cell phones come prepackaged with a number of things um, that you don't necessarily want and you can't get rid of it, um, try and disable it. Um, also like GPS. Um, if you're not using it, turn it off. Bluetooth, if you're not using it, turn it off. Um, in a company setting as well, um, one, one of the big issues is, you know, you know a comment like, yo, we don't support that um, kind of technology. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't have it. Um, but in fact, they do have it because it hasn't been actively disabled. Um, so it's sort of in a limbo state. It's, it's not active, but it's not disabled either. And quite often that, that, that can be leveraged um, in, into uh, something malicious. So the example was that that Greek um, cell phone um, incident was they had the infrastructure there, but it hadn't been um, effectively fully disabled. It was just sitting there, um, which which allowed the hackers to, to get in. And you get the concept of trust but verify versus verify then trust. Um, obviously, if you don't know what or don't expect the email, you don't know who they are. Try and verify what's happening first. Um, obviously, in an educational institution where you, you get sometimes random emails um, from potential postgrad students, um, you know, hey, you know, we, we, we've seen you publishing, etc. If we want to do a PhD, uh, you know, can you supervise us? It, it's kind of difficult because the, the nature of um, what you do in day-to-day -day business is, is, is um, would include getting those types of emails. Um, so you, you need to be able to at least try and verify look through you know can you can you find them is the email address uh, making sense um, obviously if you know the person you communicate with them well trust but verify so if there's anything unusual immediately try and verify so a common one is you know we, we're overseas we're stuck overseas we don't have money please please help you know we, we need whatever money so we, we can get back home um, the fact that you spoke to them like maybe two days ago and they're not overseas um, you know those types of emails that are, are supposedly coming from uh, someone. And we know um, a year ago, we, you know, just, just over a year ago, it started um, a number of uh, impersonation type of emails we're doing around. Um, so look at what it's saying, look at what the, the email address is um, actually in, in, in the uh, email, because it's maybe not matching with um, you know, what it should be. And they do try and mask it, and I've seen very complex ones where you had to go digging in the background to actually find that it was a scam email. And again, yesterday, um, I got an email uh, warning 
from a, a colleague of Lucy is saying that there's someone uh, using a Gmail address pretending to be him. The other side is, is keep an eye on the privacy controls in social media regularly that they keep on changing and updating these things. Um, the more privacy you have there, the more controls you have there, um, the better, as well as be wary of what you post on social media um, and don't have any passwords associated to anything major on social media. So no family names, no birthdays, uh, no favorite soccer club or anything like that. Um, then the other side, which I think is very important, is to know your rights. Um, copies are infected if you've got Consumer Protection Act, and then there's also the, the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Um, so there's a number of laws where you can actually go and find out what uh, information companies have about you, um, and also if you need to correct that kind of information. Um, so that, that is kind of important, um, especially when you, when you start getting weird calls from um, or SMSs from, from you know, the, the type of credit from certain stores, for instance, um, is you know, what exactly information do they have? Why are you maybe getting irregular uh, messages? So it could have somebody else's name that's coming to your phone, or why is that happening? Um, so they, they do need to be start being held accountable uh, to make sure their information uh, is correct. It could be you know, those types of weird messages could be that someone's entered the, the number incorrectly, um, alternatively, um, obviously, someone could be a form of like, oh, identity theft, where they've just given a cell phone number just because you had to fill it in. Um, but know your rights. Um, so you, you, you can uh, challenge corporations and, and so on to actually assure that their um, processes and, and, and information are secure. Um, I think that's all for me for now. So we can go to the Go to the questions. Uh, my email address is up there again, but I'll um, share a, a copy of the slide so you can get all the links uh, and, and go and read up on, on the various stories and so on. But you can see it now, start seeing the uh, challenge. Oh, I made a mistake in my email address. Should be .za um, at the, the last one. Um, so I'll correct that and, and then we can uh, distribute the, the slide. Um, but we, we can now hand over for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brett, for a very interesting and, uh, and useful talk. Uh, Yazira, uh, would you like us? Uh, would you like to to guide us through the question and answer session, please? Uh, you are, you are muted, Yazira. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Sorry about that. So thank you, Brett, once again for a very informative talk. We can all agree that we need to be extra vigilant. So um, there are a few questions regarding the POPIA Act. And there's a question from Ntoy. He wants to know what is the progress of South African universities in terms of responding to the presidential call to implement and embrace the POPIA Act? Um, so um, even before it was implemented, um, University of South Africa started looking at, at the privacy um, so that they, they do have a document um, that's so they provided some suggestions. Um, one of the key challenges, so obviously, the, the nature of how universities work, um, how do we deal with um, that information? And um, at that stage, they said, well, you know, the act hasn't been implemented, um, <clears throat> but we, we will, you know, the university should be looking at um, progressing into the privacy. Um, I do notice that a number of processes, especially with um, uh, the universities, are actually being improved. Um, things that, that uh, used to happen um, are, are, are suddenly being um, changed if they do not do it this way because of, of privacy implications. Um, so, so there is uh, certainly progress being made. Um, as I say, that the, it, I don't think it's a public document, but uh, say University of Africa was looking at that. Uh, there are documents where on agreement of how the, the sector would approach um, the Popular Act uh, and where maybe some limitations or certain things don't apply to the sector or might be particularly problematic for the sector that we could get exemptions from. So that there, there is that, that, that kind of um, activity in the background. It's, it, it's not, I say, not, not um, blatantly public. Um, so hopefully uh, soon that, that will be resolved um, and we'll start seeing more and more measures being put in place. 
Okay, so thank you for that. The next question is, um, the EU's GDPR is the most adopted even by companies such as IBM, etc. Do we have something strong like this in South Africa besides the POPIA Act, uh, which seems to be ignored? Um, so I think, you know, GDPR is a, is a slightly different animal to, um, it's not a pure privacy law. Um, it's more around the data protection. So they, obviously there, there is a strong overlap. Um, I, I think the reason why there, there's been a lot of adoption, it, it came in hard and fast. Um, and if you wanted to do business in Europe, you had to comply. Um, so it, it essentially it, it pushed a number of companies uh, to, to comply very, very quickly. Um, in theory, probably has got similar clauses. If we're gonna take data uh, into another country, those companies need to be um, either have equivalent privacy laws or be contractually bound uh, to, to Popia Act as well. Um, so the, the, the issue with Popia was it wasn't being implemented. Um, it was kind of there, it hadn't been announced that it was implemented and it had been sort of like in a stagnant phase. So a lot of companies just fall into this wait and see attitude. Mm -hmm. um, now it's implemented. So they, they've got a year to um, sort of get their act together. And, and to be honest, you know, when we, it, it first started coming up, um, the analysis that, that looked is that for large companies, a year is not enough. So they really should have started the process by now. Um, and, and they're going to start finding problems if they get breached and you know, they're, they're not compliant. Um, but your know, GDPR, I, I think, and, and it's kind of causing maybe potential problems down the line for Papier as well, because of, of the nature of the law, the fact that it came in so quickly. Um, so now, you know, how are we going to handle GDPR? Um, because in, in theory, it's a case of protecting European citizens. So we might have European citizens as part of our staff or students. Now, how are we gonna handle that as well? Um, so yeah, I can remember that coming out. There, there was a, a lot of focus, but again, there's the challenges in Europe with, with that implementation. And, and they're still now analyzing how, you know, is it effective or are there problems and, and so on. Thank you. Um, so there's another question. Uh, Frank Abagnale reported that the FBI is getting rid of passwords as they are the root of everything bad online. Um, can you give a few pros and cons about this major step? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, people have been looking at that for a while when, when you go password list. Um, the, the issue with passwords really is, um, you know, to have a really, really secure password for hundreds of accounts, it becomes very difficult to, to try and remember all of them. Um, also, the other side is, um, you know, people tend to write it down, uh, reuse passwords, and a number of, of, of issues there. Um, so that they're looking at other forms of authentication mechanisms. Um, as I say, you, you could have tokens, you could have um, biometrics um, as an option. Um, biometrics currently on, on laptops and, and cell phones, um, sometimes there's, there's a, a bit of misinformation around how they work, um, or misunderstanding how they work rather. Um, you know, I, I've had people try to, uh, within financial institutions, try to explain that, no, you know, if, if, if you have biometrics, only you can access your, um, the app on the cell phone. I said, well, not actually. If someone else was fingerprinted and registered, they could access it too, and they tried to argue, and I could demonstrate um, in front of them how it works. Um, so, you know, there's a number of authentication mechanisms um, that, that can try and introduce. I've seen a few proposals. Uh, I'm not sure which one the FBI is going with. Um, but, the, you know, there, there is that drive now to, to try and find something that is more secure or more stable um, than, than passwords, which, which will uh, detract from the, those types of um, issues. One, one obvious mechanism, like saying, in addition to a token that you can maybe read off, is, is if you have something that you can plug into a device like a little USB stick that's hardened and secure, could then um, be used to identify it. So it could be used like a, um, maybe, maybe like a, a dongle that you carry around with you, and which is a, a common thing. But then again, that raises issues of uh, being cloned or being stolen or lost, et cetera. So all me um, sort of mechanisms do have pros and cons. Um, it's just a case of trying to balance uh, which one. And this is why that the two-factor authentication is, is quite appealing is that if you have two different factors, you, you try and mitigate the cons of one with the pros of, of another one. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, what is the best way in which to stop ads coming through on your cell phone? Uh, and do these advertisers have an obligation under 
the popular act and I think this ties on as well to the question on what is a good antivirus for a smartphone. Um, you know, so in, in terms of um, trying to block the things, uh, the, the modern versions of Android do have a form of blocking the, I don't know how effective it is. Um, and some people have reported it doesn't seem to work um, very well. Um, you, you can get other call blockers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's, um, one blank on the name. You know, but you, you do go get those. Um, and if you go into the app stores, you know, you can find a, a variety. One, one called True Caller um, is very common. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious of those. Um, they say no, but we don't actually ever keep your number. But I've had the case where someone in front of me taking my number, he came up with my name and everything. How did that happen? No, 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 they've got, got the one app. And so if someone else has got the app with your number, it, it potentially um, copies it. But um, again, sometimes uh, ineffective. The other, the other problematic side is I've ignored numbers coming from a call center um, when it's actually a, a legitimate thing that is, is, um, I should have uh, taken. Um, so there are a number of ways. Uh, some of the, the antivirus things might have a, a, um, what they call a firewall. Uh, which will try and also help with uh, blocking numbers. Um, the, the challenge becomes uh, the, these advertising companies don't use one number, they use a, a, a block, a range of numbers. So you can block one and then the next ad becomes on another a number in the range. Uh, so um, it, it can become a little bit challenging. Um, and I've noticed sometimes I get legitimate things coming through on a same number that I'm getting um, from the advert on. Um, th that hasn't happened for a while, um, but I did notice at one stage uh, that there might have been a cross-off. Maybe they were using the same service provider uh, to, to distribute. Um, and in, in terms of the second part around, do companies have certain obligations? Yes, they do. Um, and the Consumer Protection Act, I think there was an opt-out clause. Um, so you could then opt out. Um, Sometimes it, it doesn't work, it's actually really irritating, especially when it's your own service provider that you try to opt out from and it doesn't happen. Um, with, with Pop here now, it, it's changing, so sometimes there might need to be an opt-in. Um, so unless you explicitly say you want marketing, um, they're not supposed to be sending it to you. Um, then also there's a, a, the uh, DMSA, I think it's called Direct Marketing, DMASA, Direct Marketing Association of South Africa. Um, there is a, a, a sort of a do not contact list um, where you can provide certain details and the companies are not supposed to uh, contact you. Um, sometimes, you know, if you get a call and you tell them, listen, you're not supposed to be contacted, they, they do apologize and then stop. Um, I did have one that I accidentally answered that every single day for about a week or two, I was getting phone calls from this number, which I, I just ignored afterwards. Um, that, um, you know, so you, you can register for that. It, it does, it has limited effectiveness uh, because apparently they do charge for access to the database. So companies tend to ignore it. Um, as well as that is now another repository of information. If they get hacked, you've now just provided all your details um, to say you don't want to be contacted. Uh, so you can now be contacted by military people. Um, but yes, in, in, in theory, legally, companies are supposed to be um, bound by these laws and, and there are obligations. So if you, you know, if there are irritating adverts that you're getting, particularly from a, a specific company, um, you can actually go to the company and tell them, listen, stop it now. Um, and that they need to then tell their service providers to um, sort of try and remove you off the database. Unfortunately, I think sometimes it's just a case of, you know, you allocate blocks of, of, of the phone book um, across to people, a range of numbers, yet go for phone these numbers. Um, so it, it's not tied to specific people. Um, and, and they, they just charge in it. Um, but hopefully that, that will start improving in the future. Yes, I think we have time for one last question. And uh, there's a question on what is a good antivirus for a smartphone? I'm not sure if you can suggest. Um, okay, so most of the major um, providers do have a mobile, mobile equivalent. Now, um, again, you can have um, some free versions there that you can put on. Um, so I'm not going to advertise any one specific company. Uh, in, in general, uh, Bitdefender, Kaspersky, um, you, you've got like the Norton Group, like the F-Secures and, and so on. Um, 
so so what's commercially available in the stores usually are, are fairly um, rig, uh, rigorous in, in terms of how they, they work. Um, and you can then get like an internet suite where you get for a computer plus for multiple devices. And then you also get um, other you know, like add-on apps there. Uh, so things like um, child protection, et cetera, you can, you can also implement. Um, also for cell phones, there, there are a few other companies um, that they're operating under separate names, but actually the, the companies merged. So there's like, um, I think one is called Avast, um, and there's, there's a few similar names around there, I can't remember all of them. And that you do get free ones, that they are um, do, do a fairly a decent job. There's also another common one is AVG. Um, so I think it was AVG, Avast, and a few others um, from Eastern Europe actually combined. Um, so you do have those. Some of the, the free ones are a little bit annoying that you do get adverts um, as well. Um, but you know, if, if you get one of the strong, reputable ones, I say that there are a number of, of um, websites and, and so on um, that, that do actually rank them. Um, but I, I'd say that you know, like Bitdefender, Kaspersky, etc., are some of, of, of the major ones. So go to the store; you can see what's there. Sometimes you can get it uh, cheaper online. Usually now, actually now is the time to go looking. Um, I know Bitdefender usually around this time because it's Cyber Security Awareness Month. Sometimes it's special, um, so you can get things like half price, etc. Um, so I've got one that you can actually protect 15 devices, be it computers or, or, or mobile. Um, so that actually works out quite uh, economically. Now I do say, um, there is a question I think we need to deal with, um, is, is how do we uh, identify if your information is being leaked by Experian? Um, there, there is a website called Have I Been uh, Pawned, as in P-W-N-D, uh, which is just like hacker speak for, for owned. Um, so that they, they tend to, if you put in your email address there, um, can give you a lot of information of where that email address is associated and what kind of information was um, actually um, exposed. So sometimes it is the actual password, sometimes it's what we call the hash. So it's a secured password, it's not um, the password in clear text. Um, it doesn't mean that you're 100% secure, that they just need to decrypt the hash. It's not by any means the easiest task, but it can be done. Um, and the, the cybersecurity challenge my students dealt with last year, one of the tasks was um, breaking hashes. Uh, so um, it, it is a viable thing. Um, you know, so, and, and this is one of, one of the challenges that is, is sometimes your data could be released uh, from a company or something that you're not even aware of. So if I put in one of my email addresses, weird things are popping up or, or things I've never actually ever interacted with. Um, so again, it's, it's obviously information that's been shared in the background somewhere. Um, and this is, again, just, just the pointer is sometimes keep different email addresses. So you can have one for your social media, um, one for maybe the important personal stuff like the banking and so on, um, and then one for maybe like uh, your, obviously your, your work email address and try not to, to migrate stuff um, too much. Um, so at least, you know, if uh, your social media is somehow compromised, your banking side effect and your workout side effect, or vice versa. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think there's a few more to uh, questions, but we'll allow Britt to answer that offline via email. I'll hand over back to Francesco. Thank you, Yazira. Thank you very much. And uh, Brett, I think this is now the, the, the time to, to, to thank you, because <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. concerned that um, we went a little bit over time. So thank you very much, Brett, for the very informative uh, talk. And um, I'm, if there are still a few outstanding questions, please, uh, you can um, address them directly to, to, to Brett. You saw his uh, email. I will also share a copy of the slides to you, so anyone who um, will maybe through the, the registration link um, distribute the slides. We will post, um, we'll post them online. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so now we, we all learn how to be safe in the in the cyber world, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to be safe in the in the real world because our our friend the COVID virus is still out there. Yeah, so after the after you have secured your password, please don't forget to secure your your interactions yeah? <clears throat> in, in in the real world. Yeah, so Brett, thank you very much again. Thank you very much yeah. to all the listeners. Thank you to Yazira and Ilya. And we will um, try to announce the next data breakfast as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Have a good and safe day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.